thank you very much for that introduction. I love the way he says controversy. <laughs> say it again, say it again. It's great to be here among so many people I know and such a familiar place for me. I've come back to Monticello many times and it's always good to be here. I must say I've never been here when it was raining. So this is, uh, this is uh, an interesting thing for me, a day that began at 4 a.m. this morning trying to get here quickly and taking off at one o'clock. So I'm just here by the skin of my teeth and I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here with you. I thought that I would talk a little bit about how I came to write this book, what the book is about and what it, what it means to me. Um, people who are familiar with my other work understand that my first interest in Monticello was not really the Hemingses. It was really Jefferson. Um, and thinking about Jefferson and slavery after having read a child's biography when I was in the third grade about Jefferson. And that was my introduction to history and it was when I first began to love history as a topic and began to think that, and began to know that I, this was something that I always wanted, wanted to do. Um, I won't go through all of my life story and my uh, connections or my feeling of connection to this place, but to tell you that I came to write my first book about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings because I was concerned about the way black people were portrayed in Jefferson scholarship. Um, the particular story about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings was interesting to me, but more interesting to me was how people weighed evidence and how people treated the lives and the voices of black people um, when they said things that people, some people found discomforting. This, that book was an analysis of the historiography about Jefferson and Hemings, and it was largely an analysis of the story. I thought I would put that aside at some point when that was over and I would get to what I really wanted to do was a biography of Jefferson, which I still intend to do. But as I was working on the Hemingses and thinking of this subject of the way people are portrayed in history, it occurred to me that it might be an interesting thing to do as in preparation for writing about Jefferson, sort of kill two birds with one stone, in preparation for writing about Jefferson, deal with this other question, and that is black voices and bl the black portrayal in the writing of history. Now, I should say that slavery historiography over the past 50 years has undergone obviously a revolution. Um, I often say that slavery studies is really the crown jewel of American historiography. Really great historians have put their minds to the task of figuring out what happened or telling the story of what happened in America's past, one of the most tragic aspects of Americans' past. Um, but I felt that this was something that should be brought to bear in Jefferson scholarship in particular because he is such a focus of interest of so many people and that this would be a good place to actually and a good time to actually do that. So as I was writing the historiography, writing about the historiography, uh, I, I realized, well, Jefferson was an inveterate record keeper. There's lots of material about slavery at Monticello and surely Senator Stanton and others have really pioneered and James Bear pioneered the study of writing about enslaved people on the plantation. But I wanted to do a little bit more to sort of take it a bit further because I knew that there were lots of things and lots of areas that had not really been explored in as great a depth as I thought um, they should be explored. So why I thought this was important and what kind of, kind of contribution I thought could be made to it is that, you know, typically I've often said and that for black people, enslaved people and black people today, social history really tr trumps biography. You think about slaves in a sort of an abstract way or blacks in an abstract way. Blacks are sort of monolithic. Um, whites can be individuals. And I understand why that's true. Obviously, slavery was that great overlay that blighted the lives of lots of people. And of course, you want to focus in on that system. But there were individuals within that system who reacted to that world in different ways. It doesn't mean to say that the system itself wasn't bad for everybody. Slavery was no picnic for anybody, obviously. But 
the, the, the inability or the, the reluctance or you know, so the difficulty of seeing enslaved people as individuals always struck me as a problem. And I think it's sort of a legacy of slavery that carries over to the way people see blacks today. Um, the last time I was here, I was talking about my children commenting upon television and sort of popular portrayals of black people and saying that they're basically constant. I mean, across shows, across time, you know, they're all the same type of characters. This is not to say that whites aren't stereotyped in television too, but just say, there are 27 types of white people and four types of blacks. I mean, the same kinds of things that over and over again. And because you don't, don't see or don't have the sense that there are different types of black people and different ways of going through the world. And so what I thought I might try to do with this story was to sort of help solve what I saw was a basic problem when I was writing Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, is that you can say things about people that you don't know. In order to have empathy with people, instead of pity, pity is putting someone over there. Empathy is establishing a connection that allows you to think of that person as something like yourself. And once you do that, it becomes difficult to treat that person in ways that you would not like to be treated. Um, Sally Hemings, for example, who is sort of, who was, who was a cipher in many ways, people don't know very much about her and think of her primarily as a problem, as a controversy, and I term that in my book, was a person. She was a daughter. She was someone's sister. She was someone's mother and friend. And without thinking of her in those sorts of ways, putting her in that light, it's sort of easy to say anything you want to say about her. Uh, in a sense, you know, you can give her fathers of her children sort of every 10 years based upon nothing because you don't know her, because there is no sense of a connection with her as a person. There's no care with her lives. And what I thought I would try to do with this book was to not talk not just about her, but to talk about her entire family, to put all of the Hemingses into a context that would make it easier for people to see them as human beings and not as slaves, not as part of a particular problem. So I sat down to write the book. Uh, this book was under contract, it's been under contract um, for a very long time. Things intervened. Um, I wrote a book with Vernon Jordan. Um, I edited a volume of essays. Um, the World Trade Tower fell into my apartment <laughs> and we had to start our whole life over again. So those kinds of things delayed uh, the appearance of this book. Um, I started to write, started to do research, and quickly found that there was a lot of material, things that I, I thought I was gonna be able to wrap this up in maybe 200 pages. My editor was you know, very happy that I would be able to do that. And then it started to get longer and longer and longer, and I realized that Look, you're going to have a thousand page book here, which we cannot do, um, which scare people away. So I decided to break it up into two. And this book is the first of what will be two volumes uh, of the Hemings family. And it ends in 1831 after Monticello is sold and um, the family is pretty much dispersed because I found that there was too much interesting thing, too many interesting things to say about the 19th century to kind of just wrap it up in one fell swoop.